Let's go ahead and stand to our feet, y'all, and open up with a word of prayer. And we're going to get us rolling here this morning. Everybody's so excited, wound up. We do need the rain, y'all. We've only had five inches this year. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you, we love you, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Father, that this is the day that you've made, that we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we pray, Lord, for your precious spirit, Lord, to rise up big in the hearts, minds, and lives of your people. Father, let your word make impact in our life, Father, as we finish out our study this week and next, Lord, on the uh, Proverbs chapter 3. And then starting on Romans, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would just speak to each of us what we have need of in our lives, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. You may be seated. So, guys, y'all should have gotten a new paper. We're on page 34. We're going to start with number three. We're going to talk about confidence in the Lord. Everybody say confidence in the Lord. Now, I know we missed last Sunday because we were all eating together. One that beautiful, wonderful brunch? We do that twice a year for you guys. And the staff comes and works it, and so y'all be sure to thank them. They pulled double duty last week. It's like, man, last week, Resurrection Sunday and Passover weekend is like the busiest weekend of the year for us, right up there. All right, so we have to, uh, I'm going to ask Miss Amy to be our reader leader this morning, or leader reader, and if you would do read number three for us. We must develop confidence daily. What's daily mean, y'all? Every day, every day, okay? And go ahead and read the first bullet point, sister. Galatians 6, 9, and let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. If we do not what, Luke? Give up. And as I often say, and uh, I've got Luke to memorize it now, this is not a sprint, it's a what? It's a marathon. Everybody say a marathon. That means it's, you know, a lot of times you see uh, new guys and new gals who commit their lives to the Lord, boy, they're just off to the races. And I'm always excited about that, but I always wonder in my mind where they're going to be 20 or 30 years from now, if they're still going to be entrusting their life to the Lord. And we can never, ever, ever, everybody say never. What's the last part of uh, Galatians 6, 9, those last uh, five words, same as Amy? Never, never give up. If we do not give up. Not give up. That's right, if we do not give up. So, what's that tell us right there? It's a long journey. It is a long journey. Thank you. Well said. It's a long journey. Everybody say a long journey. Now, in the light of eternity, maybe not so long, right? In the light of our perspective, man, if you live to be 100 years old, I mean, it's a long journey. But you know that during the kingdom of Christ, if you die at 100, the Bible says it's like a baby. You died as a baby because people are going to live to be a 1,000. That's upcoming. So it's all a matter of perspective. So compared to eternity, what we do in this short little span of time makes all the difference in the world to our Lord. Amen? So what's it say we have to do? The first part is let us not grow what? Of doing what? Now, it doesn't say let's not grow weary and stop there. How many of you know people are weary all the time? How many of you ever get weary? But this is a different kind of weariness. This is a weariness of doing good. And there's only a few people I know that really get weary or could get weary because they're doing good all the time. Let's talk about loving your neighbor. It's talking about doing for others. Um <clears throat> You've got to keep a balance in your life. 
What did Jesus do after ministering and laying hands on the sick and ministering to the masses? What did he do daily? Say it again, Miss Amy. He went off and prayed. Amen. Went up to the mountain. Got himself alone. So whenever you find yourself getting weary, you've got to spend some alone time with God to allow some refreshing to come. Amen. Especially if you get to where you're active in ministry and you're going and going and doing and doing and doing and going. You've got to have that getaway time to allow that season of refreshing to come. If you don't, you can grow weary in well-doing. You can get to the point where you almost become cynical. It's like, eh, and you just stop caring. Have you ever met people just stop caring? A friend of mine told me a story. How many of you here are vets, former veterans? Anybody? Former veteran? Coy, you're a former veteran, aren't you? So it was World War II, and these guys had gone off to war, and, you know, uh, in the fight in the Pacific, they had to jump from, like, island to island. They would go and, you know, conquer an island and go on to the next island to fight the Japanese, then go on to the next island. And uh, what my friend said is that there were, all these guys were in a boat, and they got to the point where some of them were just so burned out, they just stopped caring. They didn't care if they lived or died anymore because they were at the maximum level of stress. Does that make sense? And what's a sad thing is I've seen some believers and ministers get to that point. And when I was young, I got to that point where you get to that Man, you just stop caring because you've grown weary in well-doing. And the only way to fight against that is to get some alone time with the Spirit of God to bring refreshing to your soul. Amen? And also to keep in mind, what's the last part of Galatians 6, 9? It says, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will what, Miss Amy? We will reap. What's it mean to reap? To gather? What else? Gain some benefit, right? Um, <laughs> I usually use the analogy of the garden, but I can use the analogy of children. When you pour your life into children and then they get older, hopefully one day you'd like to reap some benefit from that, amen? Maybe when you're old and needing care, they can come and take care of you. Wouldn't that be nice, amen? I used to tease my son all the time back when he was a little boy. I'd say, son, I'm changing your diaper now so you remember this when I'm old. <laughs> you remember this when I'm old. But even gardening, who would love to plant a garden of vegetables and nothing ever grows and you never harvest anything? That'd be terrible. But you have to remember that one day with the Lord, we will reap. Everyone say we will reap. In other words, the Lord's going to repay a blessing to all those who have worked in his kingdom. Amen. Now, you all know we don't work for our salvation. But as you know, after you're saved, you need to be working. You need to be doing good. Amen. Because I love God, because I honor the Lord, I'm following after him and I'm working. Amen. Working. We don't work to be saved. We work because we are saved. Ooh, I like that. That is a t-shirt time, huh? That's a coffee mug there. Y'all write it down. We'll make James a millionaire here. <laughs> we don't work to be saved. We work because we are saved. Amen? And, you know, even this, uh, you know, Pastor Brian's gone this morning on a, a senior trip with, with Samuel, but he had that beautiful, beautiful banquet Um when was that? Friday night. Friday night. And uh, at the Expo Center. And it was just beautiful. I was looking around, and there were some volunteers I didn't know, but there was a lot of volunteers from our congregation working, working, amen? And I was so proud of you guys. And I was thinking that's what it's all about, amen? Doing the stuff, doing the stuff, not just hearing about it. Can you imagine... How many, how many people do you think attend church in America on a Sunday morning? There's 300 million Americans, okay? 
let's say that just 5 million go to church, okay? I'm sure it's more than that, but just say 5 million people go to church. Can you imagine if 5 million people started actually doing the stuff that the Bible talks about? That'd be amazing, wouldn't it? But how many of you know that's always been a problem? That's why the Lord says to pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send what? Laborers, workers. Everybody say workers. Workers into the field. Workers into the field because he knew we always needed workers. All right. Go ahead, sister. First bullet point. Your confidence in the Lord is a day-to-day -day life journey and experience. It is a day-to-day -day journey, not week-to-week, day-to-day. What do you think of when you think of confidence? Isla? Well, we're talking about confidence in God. So what do you think of when you think of confidence in the Lord? You know he's going to be there? Who, what'd you say, Hirsch? Trust? What else? Quick? Faith? What else? Okay. So he's your security. So confidence in the Lord, I think he's trustworthy. How many of you know that children can have confidence in their parents? Children cannot have confidence in their parents. So let's think about it from a relational state. What causes a child to gain confidence from their parents. Becca, I'm not calling you for this one. The parents are always there for them, right? That gains confidence. They don't have to wonder, is mom and dad there for me? They know mom's there, dad's there, right? What else causes a child to gain confidence in their parents? Nate? Thank you. That's a big one. Knowing that the parents are going to do what they say they're going to do. Amen? Confidence. Now, let's take those two things and let's relate them to our relationship with Christ. Can we have confidence that the Lord is going to do those things that he said he's going to do? Absolutely, totally, completely. Even if you don't believe it, even if somebody doesn't want it, it's still going to happen. I tell that to unbelievers all the time. Your lack of confidence in the Scripture doesn't mean it's not going to happen. <laughs> Everything that he said has happened, will happen, and is going to happen. Hold on, Anna. Everybody understand that? So our confidence is gained through experience and knowing that God is trustworthy. Not a little trustworthy, completely trustworthy. Amen. Somebody recently asked me, they were talking about an issue. <clears throat> Without going into details, I said this. I said, all right, so let me ask you this. Where do you think the fault lies? Do you think the fault lies with God, or does the fault lie with you? Everybody say with me. Matter of fact, let me rephrase that. The fault never lies with God. Now, that may sound simple, but a lot of people blame God for a lot of things. I did that once in my life. Have any of you ever walked that silly path? Blaming God. And you know what? In the end, it wasn't God. It was all five fingers this way. Never God. Now, his perspective's different. He does things that are beyond us always able to understand every little detail. But he's outside time and space. And the Bible says his ways are higher than our ways, higher than the heavens are than the earth. And I don't know about you, but that's probably pretty high. Amen. <laughs> that's probably pretty high. All right. <clears throat> yes, I love Right. Bullet point number two, Miss Amy. Do you think that your past experiences with the Lord can remind you of his faithfulness and in doing so give you confidence now. Absolutely, right? So what has the Lord done for you in your past that could help you in the present, give you confidence? Saved you. Okay. 
Tony? Healing? All right, so if the Lord's healed you in the past, that would give you confidence that he can and is willing to do it again, right? Deliverance, like Ms. Sheila said, um, encouragement, all those things, right? Okay. Amen. Amen. Yeah, he does a exceedingly abundantly above what we want. Ask or think if we're trusting him. Amen. And submitted to him. So let me ask you this. Who in the Bible do you think fits this? Who in the Bible relied on their past experiences with the Lord to give them confidence for what they needed? Who said that? Yes, David. And tell us the story. What happened? Yeah, so so David is about to go to battle. He's, I don't know, they say anywhere from 14 to 17 years old. His dad didn't even put him in the army, which tells me he was probably maybe a skinny, scrawny child like me. You are allowed. I was a skinny, scrawny child. I was. I had a late growth spurt in life. David was a little shepherd boy. Remember, Samuel came to anoint one of them king, and Dad didn't even call him out of the field. It can't be David, <laughs> you know. And then uh, the the other brothers are all at war. They all join the army, and they're there on uh, Mount. Uh, what is it? One of those mountains out there that's kind of close together, and there's a valley between them. I've actually physically seen video of it. It's pretty cool. And I've seen where they tested the voices, and you can hear on both sides. It forms like this natural amphitheater. And so somebody can speak on one end, and you can hear on the other mountainside. So Goliath went down into the valley, and Goliath was huge. I mean, we're talking about huge with all this armor and armor bearer and, I mean, the shield and everything else. And David goes to deliver cheese. He has, you can read it, cheese delivery boy. He goes to deliver cheese to his brothers. And while he's there, Goliath is taunting the armies of the living God, right? And make a long story short, you all remember what happened? David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine to taunt the armies of the living God? And so he says, none of you guys, now this has been going on for like a month, the Bible says, and nobody from Israel would take up the challenge, not one of them. So for a month, they're taunting each other back and forth. Can you imagine waking up to that every day? And so David says, hey, I've been here just a day, and I've already had enough. And so he goes to the king, Saul, and Saul looks at him and kind of laughs and says, you're just a kid. And this was David's reply. He said, when I was tending sheep, he said, a lion came to kill the sheep, and I grabbed that lion by the beard, and I killed it. A lion. I've seen, I saw a video last week, so funny, a big old American running from a little tiny chihuahua dog. So in America, we're running from chihuahuas, <laughs> and David's slaying lions. Grab that lion by the mane and just kill him. And then he said, one day a bear came, and I took the bear and I killed the bear. And so then he says to Saul, he says, this uncircumcised Philistine will be just like the lion and the bear, God's going to give them into my hands. So when I read what we just read, the bullet point, read it again, Miss Amy. Do you think that your past experiences with the Lord can remind you of his faithfulness and in doing so give you confidence now? Yeah, so 
as David relayed those things that God used to deliver him, what do you think he was doing? He was building his own confidence in the Lord. And now he had confidence to go against that giant. Amen? I love that. I love that. So you've got to gain some victories in your life, and you've already gained some, or you wouldn't be here this morning. You've gained salvation, right? That's a pretty big victory. So as you gain these victories, your confidence in God should grow. And you'll look back and say, hey, this happened, this happened, and the Lord was there for me. This happened, this happened, and the Lord was there for me. So this time, as I'm walking through trouble and difficulties, I'm going to have confidence in the Lord. Amen? And it builds your faith. Confidence, faith, trust go hand in hand. Everybody got that? All right, next bullet point, sister. Each day we have an opportunity to plant by choosing to follow God and do good or to choose to satisfy our sinful nature. Each day matters and each choice matters. And each day that we choose God, our confidence will grow. If you know, you have to choose the Lord every day. Now, your salvation, I'm not talking about getting saved every day. I'm talking about you have to choose to do what's right every day. Every day you wake up, it's a day who's made? The Lord. The Lord is made. And every day, Lord, <clears throat> hallowed be your name, Father. I pray this day your kingdom come, your will be done in my life. This day, as it is in heaven, that be done on earth. I pray this day for you to give me my daily bread. Remember the Lord's Prayer? Jesus, teach us to pray. So I see that not as just repeating a bunch of words, but I see that as an outline of how we should be trusting in God and entrusting ourselves every day to the Lord. Every day. Everybody say every day. Who raised their hand? Amen. Each choice matters. Everybody say each choice matters. And each day we choose God, our confidence will grow. Every choice that you make matters. How many of you know that? You can get nitty, uh, nit, uh, nitpicky, nitty gritty, nitpicky. I don't know if that's a word, but we'll make it one this morning. So you can get nitpicky, nitty witty, and you can say that even the choices of what you listen to, what you watch, can affect what you do. Amen? <clears throat> you ever hear one of those uh, <clears throat> old uh, country, western country songs, right? <clears throat> they lost their wife, they lost their dog, they lost their job. I mean, you get done listening to that, you're feeling like a depressed mess. Right? And then you listen to some other music, you can't even understand what they're saying. It's just, ah! And you just, man, I just need like to, to, to wash myself in silence for a few minutes. And it's where I know it's part of getting old. I get it. I used to love rock and roll. And then I got saved and then it was Christian rock and roll, which today we turned into praise and worship music. <laughs> it's like the, the Christian rock in my day was different than the Christian rock today. And so I'm like a praise and worship guy, just so you know, if I'm riding in the car, now, Kara's not. She's like a hard Christian rocker sometimes. But she likes her music, and it's Christian music, and that's fine. But me, I'm like a praise and worship guy because that's just me. But the, the choices we make with what we listen to, what we watch, what we say, what we do every day affects us for that day. Amen? So it goes back to making good and godly choices every day. It's not hard. If you have the Spirit of God and you love God, I love God more than I love myself, so I'm going to choose God's way. That's what it boils down to, right? All right. Thank you. Next bullet point, sister. When we live God, excuse me, when we live life God's way, He comes through for us, helps us grow, and guides us to do good for other people. Yeah, he helps us to grow 
and guides us to do good for other people. But you have to live life whose way? God's way. How often? Every day, every day, every day. Amen? Every day. And some days, his way requires you to output what your flesh may not want to input. Right? I was thinking about all these. Again, I'll use the, the, the banquet as an example. Luke had volunteered there. Not to give him a big head, but I'm glad he did. But I asked him because he came wandering into breakfast looking really tired yesterday morning. I was like, how late did you stay? And he told me. I was like, wow. So it took him several hours to clean up. So listen, nobody's flesh says, oh, it's cleanup time. Hallelujah. They do it because they love God. Amen. You don't do stuff because your body wants to do it. You do things because it's the right thing to do. Are you following me? We live in a society today and a culture where they're teaching people to do only those things that they want to do. And you people don't, young people don't want to do anything. They want to be on video games all day. And that's what they do because that's what their body wants to do. They have zero self-discipline. <clears throat> and then he helped and did dishes for us after the men's breakfast. Nobody asked him to. So... <clears throat> Giving you a few kudos there, brother. Sorry. Hope I ain't rob you of your heavenly reward there, but that's all right. So uh, <clears throat> I'm using that as an example that he guides us to do good for other people. Doing good for other people isn't always and is seldom the easy thing to do, and it's seldom the thing that your flesh wants to do. Are you following me? It just is. But it's what Heavenly Father wants you to do. Amen. And you get tired. You get to the point where you just need to rest from people for a while. Man, go up in a mountain. Got some in Rio Dosa. You can drive there. Amen. Get yourself refreshed and come back. And come back. You know, we just went through a, 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 a pandemic, right? <clears throat> and I was bragging on, I don't know, I just feel like bragging on people today. I was bragging on the same and, you know, she helped so many people in our congregation through what she did and does with our hospitality ministry. And how many of you know, when you're doing that, and there were some months it was like constant. There was like no break, no break at all. You're doing it for Jesus, amen? You're not doing it because, oh, another person's sick in the hospital. It's fun. You're doing it because you're being used you're Jesus' hands, Jesus' feet. Amen? And I tell people all the time, and I keep telling you older guys, find something to do, lest you end up not doing anything. Find something to do in the kingdom. Amen? If you don't know what to do, ask Heavenly Father, and he'll show you. Amen? He will show you. We never retire from the kingdom of God. You can retire from business. That's between you and who is it? Social Security? <laughs> but you don't retire from the kingdom until you go home to be a part of the kingdom. Sorry, just the way it is. I can't find that anywhere in Scripture. Now, I can retire from this form of ministry and do another form of ministry, but you don't retire from God's kingdom until you go home to be with Jesus. Amen? Then you're retired. Then you can rest. All right. Keep going, sister. Well, let me first say that I have a lot of people behind me that help me do what I do. Amen. I've never had anybody turn me down if I've asked for food or whatever's needed, Pastor. Amen. So we have some awesome servant-hearted people in this church. Yes, we do. Praise the Lord. Thank you. It's very kind of you to mention them. God placed his family members, friends, co-workers, and even strangers in our paths that we are meant to influence for the better. Your confidence in the Lord can be appealing to them if it is genuine and consistent. Do you think your do you think that family members, friends, and coworkers or strangers can see confidence in your life that you have in the Lord? You think so? Has that ever happened to anybody here? Tell me what happened. Real loud, sir, by here.
Awesome. Awesome. So somebody in a small group heard her sharing and noticed there was some, what do you say, life? Light in her and asked her what it was. And she told him, it's Jesus, amen. And uh, he ended up making a prayer closet in his own life to spend time with the Lord. Somebody else, your confidence affected somebody else, co-worker, friend, family member. I'm sure it has. Luke? Um, my father wasn't, you know, the strongest believer. and He had some weird beliefs growing up, honestly. Uh, he never really went to church, and even if he had a choice or not to, he, he chose not to. Um, but recently, uh, you know, I never thought I could convince him of doing anything. He, he's very hard-headed, very prideful. I mean, very. Like, you try to tell him he's wrong, he'll get cranky and go hide in his room. Um, but as I've changed and realized that I am changing, and even though I didn't think I could ever do anything, I pray to the Lord, see if I can maybe help him in some way or help my family in some way. Um, he noticed me change, and for the first time and first memory in my life that I can actually really recall, he was crying and said he was proud of me, and he started coming back to church now, and not very often, but when he has the opportunity, he so opens start. up to it. Amen. Start. Praise God. Beautiful testimony, brother. Beautiful, beautiful. So listen, confidence in God is contagious. It's appealing. Amen. I like hanging around people who are confident in the Lord. Have you ever been around somebody who just has no confidence in God at all, and they're just down in the dumps 24-7? I mean, every day, they're just always, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. And then you meet somebody else going through the same difficulty that they're going through, and they're like, the Lord is my strength. I'm entrusting myself to God. God's going to help. He's going to deliver. Amen. They have a confidence in the Lord that isn't, isn't fake. It's genuine. And I'll tell you what, people today are looking for that which is authentic, and they're looking for genuine, especially young people. Young people are looking for something that's real. They're tired of old-fashioned church. I'm just telling you, they are. They're looking for something that is genuine. And if they don't see genuine believers, they're not interested. They're just not. Amen, Pastor. All right. Go ahead. No, that's what they're looking for. It is. It is. It's just the generation, you know. Listen, you can only be on so much fake media and fake social stuff your whole life, and you start hungering for something authentic and something real. And that's really where the, the younger generation is today. Okay? All right, next bullet point, sister. When we are close to God, we have the confidence to share our lives give generously, and sacrifice to help others. When we are close to God, we have the confidence to share our lives, give generously, and sacrifice to help others. What's the first part of that? You have to be what? Everybody say close to God? You have to be close to God, right? How are some ways, here we go again, how are some ways we draw close to God, Nate? Say it louder. Say it louder. Pretend you're blowing that show far. Prayer, even put a little southern accent to that. <laughs> wow, that was pretty good, Nate. Who are you? My East Texas friend? Prayer? I feel like I'm back in Nacogdoches. That was pretty good. So listen, yeah, you've, the, the key to this is you've got to draw close to God, y'all. I mean... It's just a, 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 a must, a must, a must, a must. I would say that's 90% of most people's issue. So they don't spend enough time in prayer. Oh, yeah, you do. Because you're kind of like that, uh, you become kind of like that vessel. It's just been drained. And, you know, you can go maybe a day or two, 
and you're living on leftover manna. Oh, I read my Bible Monday, and here it is Friday. I hadn't cracked the Bible, hadn't really prayed, hadn't spent time with God. I feel so yuck and so dry and so dead inside. And every day the Lord's desiring us, amen? And it really isn't hard. You just have to discipline yourself and get yourself into the habit. Once you do, it's life-changing. Just telling you, it's life-changing, amen? It's life-changing. You could be goofed up on everything else, but you spend time with God, you'll come out of that prayer closet changed and different every day, every day, every day. And over the course of a month, two months, a year, two years, a decade, two decades, you're going to turn around and say, wow, that is a miracle what God did in that person's life. Amen? And it all started because they decided to get close to God. His way. Everybody say his way. His way. Go ahead, sister. When we believe God has our back and we allow his word to guide us, there is nothing that can stop us from loving others to the fullest. Amen. I love that. Not just because I wrote it, because it's true. <laughs> when we believe God has our back, he does have your back. Amen. <clears throat> How many of you have ever had a best friend you could really trust yourself to? You know, really good friends are kind of hard to come by. You know, they don't just happen, I don't think. But when you've got one, you're just really, really thankful, right? But listen, Jesus is a best friend who sticks closer than a brother. And I'm telling you, he always, Maria, has your back. Always, 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 God has your back. Amen? And that gives me joy. <laughs> like, Lord, everybody else might be picking up stones, but Jesus has my back. Amen? Can you imagine? I think again of David. <laughs> How many of you remember the story where David was... Uh, out with his soldiers, this is before he was king, he was living in Philistine, and he went out with his soldiers, and they had left the women and the children in the town of Ziglag, and they went off to battle, they came back, and all of their city was burned, their women and children were taken hostage. Can you imagine coming home, find your house burned and your family kidnapped? And you're leading a troop of soldiers, and it happened to all of them? Well, who do you think that the soldiers immediately want to blame? They want to blame David. So the Bible says that they... The Bible, Adela Hell trying to out-preach me here. The Bible says that they picked up stones to stone him. Now, he's the leader. Was it his fault? No, but it doesn't matter. When things go bad, people want to stone the leader. It's just part of, part of the, the price of leadership, I guess. So things were not going well, so they picked up stones to stone David. And who remembers what the Bible says that David did? Anybody? I help you. The Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. That's what he did. Everybody's ready to pick up rocks and stone him to death. He doesn't freak out. He goes and he encourages himself in the Lord. And the Holy Spirit says, this is what you do. Make a long story short, they went out. They recaptured their wives, their children, their livestock. And they recaptured more than they had lost. And they won the battle. But I don't think it would have happened if David had not first encouraged himself in the Lord. How many of you know, we live in a dark day. You've got... Media against you, you've got politicians, you've got the devil, you've got demons, you've got all kinds of darkness out there. You've got to keep yourself encouraged in the Lord. James shared a scripture earlier. It said that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world, right? But you've got to allow him who's in you to encourage you and to live big in you. You've got to. Anybody here ever get discouraged just with life? Because the life happens? Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Everybody say trouble. I think they turned that into a song, didn't they? <laughs> but in this life, you're going to have trouble. But the good news is he's overcome. Amen. So just because you go through troubles, learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. Amen. 
And loving others to the fullest, that's about you getting your eyes off of yourself and putting them on who? Putting them on others. Putting them on others, amen? Always remember, guys, the cross, I'm going to set this down and talk to you for a minute to finish up. So the cross has a vertical piece. Talk about the cross of Jesus, right? Has a vertical piece and has a horizontal piece. The vertical piece is you and your relationship to Heavenly Father through Jesus, right? The horizontal piece is you and your relationship to your brothers and sisters and other people. You can't have one without the other. You can't have, oh, you know what? I'm going to love God and serve God, but I don't want anything to do with people. Because the Bible says that if you say you love God, you've got to love your brother. And that's talked about doing good for him. It's not talked about some emotion. Ooh, I love you. And you can't say, I'm going to love my brother but not love God. It takes everything, both pieces, you loving God and you loving each other. Amen? And if you start to get weary in this piece, remember, you're going to reap if you don't faint and don't give up. And then you might need to climb to the top of a mountain for this piece, get re-energized, refilled, refreshed, a lot of re's there, right? Refilled, re-energized, refreshed, and then come back down, and then you can do this piece some more. Then you can do this piece. Amen? Everybody got it? All right, let's see where we're at. Last bullet point? Yep. Last bullet point, sister, on that one. When you get tired, remember, never give up. Everybody say never give up. Quit is not in your vocabulary. Amen? There is no divorcing God. There is no quitting God. I'm just going to quit the Lord. What? Have you lost your mind? The one person that's got your back is your best friend is everything you have need of in your life. He said, I am that I, I am that I am. Everything you have need of, and you're going to quit him? That makes, that makes no sense to me. That's just a lie of Satan, right? And how many of you know the devil, especially new believers, whisper in their ear, you know what? Just quit God. Live for yourself. And it's just a lie. There is no giving up. There is no going back. There is no reverse. There is only forward. Amen? All right, let's all stand to our feet. Ephraim, if you would make a note for me on mine for my brother, brother, brother. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll let you guys hang out in fellowship. Father, we love you. We bless you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for class this morning. Father, I pray that something said, Lord, that a word shared will inspire and encourage, Lord, those who have been going through maybe just some struggles, some difficulties, Lord, that they'll find a season of refreshing in their life with you, Lord, that they'll draw near to you, Lord. They'll draw close to you, Father. Lord, bless this time of fellowship, Lord, with your people. Encourage them. Help them to learn to love one another, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.